So next speaker is uh, Aniruda Katua. Are you yeah. here now? Yes, I definitely. Sir. Yes, uh, now you can share your screen and uh, you are. Are you ready to give a talk now? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, to start my camera also, it's okay. Yeah, that's okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, can uh, can anyone see me see my screen yes it's great thanks you can start uh, your presentation okay <laughs> good morning and good afternoon to you <laughs> so uh, uh, today my presentation is on investigating the effect of lockdown during the COVID-19 on land surface temperature and uh, cooling degree days. It is a study of the Pashtun Medipur district in West Bengal, India. So these are the contents, first, uh, like the introduction about the things like what is LST and what is uh, CDD, cooling degree days. Then the methodology is divided into three parts, the study area, the materials we used and the data pre-processing before the analysis and then the results and discussion and then the conclusion. So the um, we can say like uh, land surface temperature, uh, basically the radiating temperature from the surface, uh, surface of the earth. And to determine the terrestrial thermal variable, we, were, uh, we study mainly the land surface temperature of an area. And uh, because of the earth surface is very heterogeneous in nature. So it kind of a difficult uh, task to estimate and validate the particular parameter with the ground truth data. Uh, and the cooling degrees are the energy it measures the energy needed to cool down or the amount of energy radiated from the building to cool down the building to a particular temperature. So now here CDD is user defined, like at which temperature the building should be cooled, it is totally user defined and it is totally dependent on the various factors like the type of the building, like how much big it is or what is the construction type of the building, what are the materials of the building the weather condition of the area, then the geographical position of the area, like whether it's situated on the tropical uh, area or the uh, near the equator or in the subtropical area, that's what, then again, the elevation. These are the factors that decide the uh, CDD of a particular uh, building that how much energy is to be radiated from that particular building to cool down to a particular temperature. Now, this study has a research question about this. That. Yes? Is there anything problem, sir? Okay. No problem. I muted somebody who makes noise. Okay, okay, okay. Um, then the study has a research question about the scenario that the variation with the CBD LSD during the pandemic situation. Like there are uh, so many things are going to be changed and already changed during this pandemic situation. So mm -hmm. that uh, we will study for that whether uh, this has a particular uh, like uh, effect on the, these two parameters or not. So now the study area is, uh, it is a village named Garmal. Uh, falling under the Salmoni Tehsil of the Pashtun Mandipur district, like we can see here, a very small district. In the you can see in the picture that uh, it is uh, the first one is the uh, state of India that's named as West Bengal. Then a particular Tehsil is known as Pashtun Mandipur, and from that the orange uh, area uh, we can see is the is our study area. Now this area falls under the tropical region, so we can see variation in seasons throughout the area, throughout the year. So we, it is very like uh, in the May of the month where it find, uh, like generally goes under the summer season. So like it, it would be ideal for calculating the CDDs of the buildings. 
now the methodology part in the, the material used is the sentinel 3 satellite image the lst part uh, lst images of the sentinel 3 from the year of may uh, from the month of may in the year of 2020 and the, from the month of may in the year of 2019 in the daily basis like for the whole month daily basis cdd values and lst values are collected of the study area now all the images that we have uh, gathered has the wgs 1984 projection and the total server and the uh, uh, total images is subset according to the study area coordinates in order to find the proper temperature values because it's considered like it is uh, the whole image can covers a whole a lot of area and there is a huge difference in temperature throughout the area so uh, we subsetted the um, total uh, image into the study area part so now the data preprocessing of the LST values for the study area were extracted in Kelvin. So for uh, ease of uh, calculation and analysis, we converted it to the centigrade scale. And the CDD values are divided by the corresponding uh, that particular day's LST values to uh, that are converted into the centigrade scale. And the logarithm of the each ratios has been taken into account. Then the correlation between that logarithm of the ratio and the CDD value has been done. Now, the, uh, we, in the result part, we have seen that the correlation coefficient for the May 2020 is 0.825 and for the May 2019 is 0.723. Both the values are significantly higher than 0.5. So, which, uh, which leads to the a particular um, thing that the CDD and LST are directly proportional to each other. And if CDD, if LST increases, then CDD also will increase. And if LST decreases, the CDD will also be decreased. That means if the LST on a particular day, if the LST value is low, then less amount of energy will not will be needed to be radiated so that the uh, building will cool down to a particular temperature. Now, the air also we have seen that for the May 2019, the CDD, both the CDD and LST values are more. Uh, then May 2020 on the daily basis. And if the CDD value is more, then uh, we can assume that more energy consumption or more energy to be needed uh, to cool down a particular bill. So here we can see the chart that uh, the correlation, using the correlation factor, we have created a, uh, we have plotted the values in daily basis for the CDD and the log of CDD by LST for both the 2019 and 2020. Uh, we can see it follows directly most of the, uh, the scatter diagram, mostly follows uh, linearly. And uh, then the conclusion we can get, get that the direct relation, there is a direct relation between CDD and LST and it defines that uh, LST has a prominent effect on changing the building temperature. And due to this pandemic situation, we can assume that pollution is decreased. So for that, uh, ILST would also be decreased and that will cause the decrease in CDD also. That we will check in the further uh, research work that whether it, how much is going to change and how the exact way to change the CDD and what are the effects of LST in other aspects. And in future, we will do that during the COVID scenario. So thank you. I end my... Uh, presentation here. So, if there are any questions, kindly please ask. Any questions from from other speakers or audience? Aniruddha, I have a questions. Yes, sir. What kind of software do you use for processing the Sentinel images? Uh, yes, sir. I use Snap. Uh, it is a open source and uh, free to download, free to use software. Snap Sentinel. Uh, data application and procedures. Have you ever experienced uh, processing the uh, Landsat A? Actually, as Landsat far as, you, know, you can uh, calculate the LST from Landsat A as well. Yes, sir. We can, I, can, uh, I can calculate the LST from the Landsat 8, but there are different type of algorithms uh, established for the Landsat 8. And we have to, uh, we don't have a particular algorithm. So it may lead to conclusion, uh, like may lead to confusion because different algorithm gives different, uh, a slightly different value. And we would, uh, would not be able to like, it will create a lengthy process. It will create a, uh, it will have a computationally it's expensive. And uh, for Landsat 8, uh, if uh, like um, there are two bands of the, th to calculate the LST and there are different values for that also. So if we use Landsat 8, it's possible, then we have to find for both the bands, band 10 and band 11, 
and we have to calculate uh, using the uh, all the algorithm that has been est established for the elastic estimation so it would be more time consuming and uh, a bit of computationally expensive rather than using sentinel 3 mm -hmm. so that's why we use sentinel 3 right okay, any other questions any other speakers questions? audience Can I stop sharing, sir? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, sir. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. And then thank the, you very much, sir. Yeah. And then the next uh, presentation will start on uh, two forty in Korean time. So you are now having a ten minute break. <laughs> we need to keep on the timetable. Anyway, yeah, uh, I would like to check. So whether Minachi is here? Yes, sir, I'm here only. Okay, okay. Now you, you can start your presentation on 2.40. So after 10 minutes break, you can start. Okay, sir, fine. Okay, sure. okay. Let's have a break. <laughs> thank you for your concise and very brief presentation. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yep.
Okay, everybody, it's time to resume our session. The third speaker is uh, G. Minachi. Minachi, are you here now? Yes, sir. I'm here, sir. Charming. Yes. Yeah. And Minachi will give a talk on the assessment of urban spatial growth for Twitch district, Haminadu, for better solid waste management using geospatial technologies. Please welcome Minachi. Yes, sir. Very good morning, everyone. I'm Jiminakshi from Bhargazan University, Trichy, Tamil Nadu. I welcome you all to my presentation. I hope I'm audible to everyone, and my presentation is also visible. Second. Yes, sir. So the title of our work is Assessment of Urban Spatial Growth for Trichy District, Tamil Nadu, India for Better Solid Based Management Using Geospatial Techniques. These are the contents of our study area. Urban growth analysis has been done using LVLC, NDVI and NDBA maps and it has been correlated. According to the respective urban growth, our study aims at selecting suitable site selection of landfills for better solid waste management. So the increasing population and rapid urbanization are of great concern to the municipal authorities for the management of solid waste. Uh, so it is one of the global environmental problems in world today. One of these impacts is due to the location of dumping site in unsuitable areas. So the suitable site selection is important in this case. So our aim is to study the urbanization and its effects in Trichy city. Uh, so the NDVI, NDBA and LSE maps were prepared using open source software that is QGIS and it were integrated to create environmental vulnerability map. Then to correlate LST with factors like vegetation cover and built up index. So according to the according to the urban cover, the proper sites for solid waste dumping have been proposed for our study area. So this is our study area. This figure shows our study area. There is Sitrapalli city in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu, the administrative headquarters of Trichy city. It is the fourth largest municipal corporation and the fourth largest urban agglomeration in the state. So the study area maps were prepared by using Indian topo sheets with a scale only to 50,000. Since this is our methodology, we have identified the problem of the study area and by using remote sensing data, maps were created using QGIS. By using topo sheet and published data, we have created the mentioned maps. And by using satellite data, LULC maps and all are created, then we have extracted LSC and NDVA and NDBA maps for the year 1997-2007-2019 as the availability of data and then we demarcated the urban group. According to that, best landfill site for solid waste management has been done by using weighted overlay analysis at the end. So this is the data purpose and uh, the data and with its purpose and with its spatial resolution, Landsat 5 thematic mapper and 8 OLA that is operational land images sensor was used for making LULC, LSC, NDBA and NDBA maps and their data was uh, uh, were used for the respective purposes as mentioned. Uh, so the primary thematic maps such as base maps, geomorphology, lithology were created using QDIS software. And the first one is the geomorphology map, which has been prepared on 1 6000 scale based on the digital interpretation using satellite data. Different landform units were identified such as floodplains, pediments, insel waves, braid bars, and our study area is mostly dominated by weathered pediplain. Next one is uh, lithology. It is very important to study the rock type of the study area. Mostly southwestern part is covered by hornblende biotite gneiss and tarnakite, fluvial and granite was covered in other parts. So the soil map, the district is predominantly covered by these three major soil types. It is uh, Luvisols, Fluvisols and Orthic Luvisols, which was created in QGIS by using the source GSI. Uh, then this is the drainage map with four order of streams. Then the population density map was created by using census of India data. It was joined in QGIS as BSRA shape file and by giving the equal interval that is quantile classification, the resulting map has been done. The red zone shows higher population, whereas green shows lower population zone. Next one is land use and cover map. So the land map imageries are used for image analysis for the year 1997 and the year 2007. The supervised method of image classification is followed for image analysis using QGIS. It's carried out, it is carried out to avoid any misclassification. And we were digitized it uh, 
for higher accuracy. In nineteen ninety seven, you see there are more number of natural vegetation and crop land and less urban area. And when you see in two thousand seven, the breadth of land day by day was increasing because of uh, or pop because of increasing population and mitigation of people like rural from rural to urban area. Uh, then LULC for two thousand nineteen. So there is tremendous increase in urban area, as you can see here, and very less crop lands and the built-up plants as a uh, less crop lands are there, and built-up plants has increased, and natural vegetation has been converted into settlements and more industries, as you can see in this map. Then this is the temporal changes in LULC. So total one forty four square kilometer there, and the respective features of LULC with their area in square kilometer as given in this table. As well as in the bar graph, the area was calculated in a field calculator using QGIS. Then NDVA. This is normal like different vegetation index. It is a measure of the amount and record of vegetation at the surface. NDVA is very sensitive to changes and variations of NDVA might cause changes in land surface temperature. Uh, so this is NDVA map from 2007. This has been Using this formula, near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red. That is band five minus band four divided by band five plus band four. So from our observation, from our observation, high surface temperature was observed in built-up and bare surfaces, whereas low surface temperature in green vegeta in green vegetative areas. Then this is the NDVA for 2019. Here red shows no vegetative area. That is NDVA have shown a very strong negative relationship with LST and NDVI, which I'll show you in the next slides. LST, LST is the temperature at interface between the Earth surface and its atmosphere. To calculate the temperature, between the algorithm was used, and by using QGIS as the calculator, we have done the LST extraction. So that is by the So data is directly linked to the LST through the radiance radiative transfer equation. This is the equation for conversion of BN values to the spectral resistance. So that is the L lambda is R maximum minus R minimum divided by Q cal minimum minus cal minus cal minimum into DN with the respective cal minimum plus R R minimum. There is nothing but spectral and sensor radiance that is scaled to that particular temperature. So in the next step, uh, we converted uh, our reflectance values into satellite brightness temperature, which in this case is the LST in Kelvin. This is done with the mentioned equation and also needs some data from the meta file for K1 and K2 values. Then we can show the final results in QGIS like this. This is how the results looks like for the year 1997 and uh, 2007. Landsat 5 thermal band six were used with 30 meter resolution. The different thermal signatures uh, seen in the LST maps of the study area because of the different land cover classes are there, having different physical properties. So the statistics showing minimum and maximum values of LST is given in the statistics table. I'll also show you that. This is uh, LST for 2019. Landsat 8 thermal band uh, 10 band 10 has been used, and the map has been done using the above mentioned equations in the previous slide. So this is the statistics of LST from 1997 to 2019. Approximately 4 degrees Celsius has been increased peak. Then NDVI, which is nothing but normalized difference uh, buildup index, it is useful to map the urban buildup areas using this equation. Using Landsat 5, NDVI for 1997 and 2007 were created using that formula in raster calculation in QGIS. This is uh, uh, NDVI for 2000, 1997, and that is the NDVI for 2007. Then. Uh, This is NDVI for 2019. Landsat 8 data were used for this. Results of NDVI of year shown the maximum surface temperature in build-up area or urbanization is uh, inducing uh, much surface temperature variation. Then uh, this is environmental vulnerability map. The red color in the legend shows the high vulnerability. So it has been done using QGIS by using LST, NDVI, and NDVI maps, and we have reclassified it. And by using major overlay analysis, we have done environmental vulnerability map. Then uh, correlation studies coming to correlation, like during the study, relationship between NDVI and LST were developed 
and the, with using maximum minimum and standard deviation using the metadata file then the covariance and correlation matrix was calculated using pearson correlation coefficient uh, the uh, ndb and lse correlation uh, like having a strong positive relationship has been existed in each season so the positive relationship found between ndb and lse indicates that we are generating much surface variations uh, which is ultimately contributing in urban detail land then uh, lsc and uh, ndva correlation so the strong negative correlation of ndva and lsc indicates the healthy green vegetation lowers the surface temperature effectively this is our findings so the lsc map generates the gradient temperature which increases about 3.95 degrees celsius in 2019 when compared with the year of 1997 and 2007 the environmental vulnerability map shows that the radiant temperature variability as a result of uh, rapid urbanization and it ultimately causing decreases in vegetation so these are the mitigation measures uh, that we can which will be helpful for climate change mitigation then site selection for solid waste management so as you all know manual analysis of swm is very tedious one so by using limitations and make waste management planning to be very effective and also it can be quickly implemented so the various data like road map slope map lulc road and river buffers were created and digitized using qgis and weighted overlay was carried out to find the best suitable site for landfill for dumping the solid waste this is the existing solid waste disposal site in trichirapalli it is about 400 to 600 tons per day they are generating a Uh, the waste, so which is situated by an open dumping yard, naming Arya Mangalam in the garbage ground. So the unscientific landfill may reduce the quality of the drinking water by contaminating the surface and ground water through leachate, and uh, it will cause serious diseases like jaundice, asthma, and all for the people. So the the locating proper site for solid waste disposal is a very important con concern and it should be far from residential areas and uh, settlements which is very important for the management of solid waste and thematic maps will create the elevation is an important as you all know elevation is an important parameter in the identification of landfill site in the method used here the land morphology was evaluated uh, using the grading of the slope and specified in degree format the areas with high slopes are not ideal for solid waste disposal and also flat areas are also not that much ideal under so this figure shows our study area which is mostly flat terrain based on the slope aspect that is slope direction is uh, created using qgis then uh, before going into the road buffer lulc is very important and should be considered for swm the dumping site should not be selected close to the build up area to avoid uh, adversely affecting land value and future development and to protect human being from environmental hazards okay that which was created from dumping site so it should be resulted at a suitable distance farther from the residential area so a scrub and barren land are most suitable for dumping sites sir. then geology of the area also should be considered which i have shown in the previous slides then uh, road buffer uh, road then the road and uh, railway networks has been digitized from topo sheet using qgis and the buffer zones were created for both roads and railways and also for rivers finally the suitability has been created based on the weighted overlay analysis weights have been assigned to each class of all thematic maps uh, for weighted overlay analysis to find the best suitable map for site selection so the criteria like slope geology lulc distance from road and distance from main river has been taken and uh, the table represents the weightage for each criteria and we are using raster calculator was used in qgis raster calculator was used for weighted calculating the weighted sum and overlay has been done by assigning the particular weightages to each class in qgis this is the site suitability your Red indicates the highly suitable area, and green indicates the less suitable. Coming to conclusion, so as you all know, and so far you can understand, absolute increase in the accumulation of solid waste and its management is one of the greatest challenges faced by uh, the uh, municipal authorities of Trichy city. So the present research provides uh, some optimal, more or less, some good optimal solution to characterize. 
particular landfill sites based on the rapid urbanization in city city using open source gis software so the awareness on proper waste disposal is necessary for those who are generating waste in day to day life including us and we have to provide our training to people for proper solid waste management in future these are the references i have taken from thank you Okay, thank you so much for your great presentation. So any questions from speakers or audience? I have one question. Okay. Yes. Can you go to that uh, correlation uh, matrix where NDVI and LST is correlated? Yes, sir. This one. Next one, the vegetation index. This one. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, here, uh, see, for 1997, there is a negative correlation. For 2007, there is a negative correlation. And for 2019, it's a very huge positive correlation. Right. So what happened between like in 12 years that caused that much of positive correlation between that LST and NDVA? Can you explain, please? No, actually NDVA has shown very strong negative relationship with LST and NDVA, as you know. So wait, I'll show that. No, Mark see, uh, in NDVA you have shown that, no, uh, in NDVA part you have shown the matrix. That is in 2019. Uh, in 2019, it is showing uh, a very steep uh, positive correlation. And I in know. other two years, in 1997 and 2007, it's showing very uh, negative correlation. And that is from minus 0.5 and minus 0.57. That's all. But in like in 12 years, there must be going some huge weather conditional change also. So that, that LST and NDVI uh, directly changed and it's showing positive correlation, right? So, like, uh, can you explain this? Yes, uh, as you said, uh, so, wait, I'll explain. the builder plan day by day was increasing also because of increasing urbanization. It is in future also it will show some very strong. Okay, positive. then, uh, then just please show me the table where you have shown the changes in square kilometer, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, the square kilometer area changed. The land type, land yes. use, land cover. Yes. Yes. Where you have uh, showed the, you have shown that, uh -huh, aha, it's this one. So, in 1997, the urban area has changed to 50%, then it's changed to 100%, right? From 20 to 23 square kilometers. So, in 23 square kilometer within a time period of uh, 1997, 10, 22 years, do you think uh, it's a very huge change? Within, tw yes. within 20 years, it's have changed from 20 to tw uh, 43. That means 23 square kilometer area changing and at an average to uh, like uh, 1 or 1.5 square kilometer area is changing per year. So, do you think that is the... Uh, that can be the cause of uh, this much of uh, change in correlation between the yes, LST course, and NDVI. Yes, this is the major reason land use and cover urban area increasing increasing of in urban area is the major reason for that uh, very strong and correlation. In I think I think okay. I think you just uh, do it a research a bit. Uh, it's not the only reason for that NDVI and. Uh, changing to that much of it's changing its direction as well as it's changing its relation also so that's why i was concerned okay but, uh, thank you i've got it's my it's answer okay, fine, fine. okay yes thanks okay yeah. uh, 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 can i just can i just add with a little sir uh, so uh, the, the the first two years shows that uh, it's a negative correlation with the lst while the last year shows positive so that means with the increase in NDVI value, your LST is increasing, which might contradict the uh, uh, case that it says that uh, the, with the increase in vegetation, the land surface temperature is increasing in this case. 
is lang lst is getting increasing so, no but with the increase in ndvi see you are you are uh, estimating only ndvi and lst a higher value of ndvi means there is supposedly vegetation yes sir so if yes, your yes. ndvi is increasing then your lst should decrease not increase so please just uh, have a look there might be some kind of maybe uh, the symbol error or yes, something yes, like yes. that i'll just, just uh, i'll just look, look at it i'll just look at it here kindly thank you Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great questions. And any other questions? We have one minute left, so uh, we may have one more questions. No? Okay. Okay. Thank you for your great presentation, Minachi. Thank, thank you. you. Yep. And then the, let's move on to the next speaker. Next speaker is uh, Hussain. Hussain, are you here now? Hussain, I can see. Ah, uh, hello, hello. Ah, okay, okay, great, great. So uh, I would like to introduce Hussain. He will talk about uh, a noble non non a non destructive self design technique for upscaling chlorophyll region using that model. Would you please start your presentation? Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so, good morning, everyone. So, sir, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so today I'm going to present about a, a novel non to self design technique for upscaling chlorophyll region using DART model. So coming to uh, chlorophyll, so the spectrum of the tree species are influenced by biophysical parameters, biochemical uh, parameters, tree pigments, water content, leaf structure. And coming to these biochemical parameters, they help, uh, they help in the uh, finding the health condition of the tree species. Chlorophyll is one such biochemical parameter and is, it is an important tree pigment and is also useful in photosynthesis. And uh, coming to this estimation of chlorophyll, there are many traditional techniques, but these are destructive techniques. These involve organic solvents. Uh, they may be toxic to skin and all usage of those organic solvents. So this, uh, moreover, these traditional techniques are uh, not suitable for large scale studies and there would be loss of pigments. So in order to estimate for chlorophyll, uh, traditional techniques uh, are mostly toxic and they cannot be used for large scale studies and they are destructive techniques. So non-destructive techniques are the best suitable for chlorophyll estimation. Canopy reflectance is one such non-destructive technique used for chlorophyll monitoring. It can be done by evaluating vegetative indices, simple ratios, chlorophyll index. And among these non-destructive techniques, hyperspectral remote sensing was proven to be best suitable for examining chlorophyll content for large scale studies. Uh, so, so in that way, many hyperspectral vegetation indices were developed in order to find out the chlorophyll content coming to objectives of this study. So, uh, first objective is to upscale leaf reflectance applied from field study into the canopy reflectance using dark model. Second objective is to upscale leaf reflectance applied from field to canopy reflectance using indices ratio. Uh, it is a part of using hyperspectral indices. Next is to perform chlorophyll analysis for above uh, both uh, above both upscaled canopies, which came from objectives one and two, using hyperspectral indices. Coming to so this is methodology. So we have reflectors, uh, leaf reflectance of ten species from field. We will upscale that to canopy reflectance using dark, and we will find out hyperspectral indices of that canopy reflectance. And also we will find out hyperspectral indices of uh, field study using these two hyperspectral indices we will find out another canopy reflectance and using these indices we will analyze the chlorophyll content in those species so steady area is it is a uh, steady area is aruku forest it is located in the eastern guards of the vishakhapatnam district of andhra pradesh state in india as you can see here this circle this is the steady area uh, this region enjoys a uh, monsoon climate with its characteristics. On the basis of the local rainfall conditions, four seasons, including two monsoon seasons, are recognized. So, 
this area have southwest monsoon from june to september northeast monsoon from october to december january to february it have winter march to may it has summer coming to field data so bunch of the leaves from uh, each of the following mentioned 10 species were collected from field in two different seasons and using spectro radiometer reflectance analysis are done and bunch of leaves collected so these are the 10 species uh, from which bunch of leaves are collected from the uh, field field they are bikela champaka grevela robusta malatus filipensis polyaltia lognifolia pongamia pinnata petrocarpus marsupium teros param xylocarpum cisium cumini terminalia arjuna terminalia cebula uh, so coming to dart dart uh, which means which is acronym for discrete anisotropic radio to transfer it is a 3d radio to transfer model it is rt model it is designed for simulating radio to propagation from visible to pr in complex heterogeneous landscapes like forest with atmosphere and topography it to the structural and spe spectral properties of objects for radiation simulations it is used for simulating forest canopies so coming to hyperspectral indices so hyperspectral indices used in this study are pigment specific normalized radio uh, difference uh, uh, in short for psnd and pigment specific simple ratio which is short for pssr these indices of leaf reflectance from field and upscale canopy reflectance are calculated and they are used in this study so uh, the wave and 680 nanometer 635 nm 470 nm are fixed for estimating chlorophyll a chlorophyll b carotenoid respectively because they represent absorption maxima of three pigments chlorophyll a b and carotenoid respectively so these are the hyperspectral indices used uh, so uh, we have two uh, six indices three of which comes under pigment specific normalized difference three of which comes under pigment specific simple ratio so here subset a b c represents uh, they they are the indicators of chlorophyll a b and carotenoid respectively so using uh, this first uh, indices we will try to find out chlorophyll a b and carotenoid same with another second indices so this is correlational ratio uh, using indices ratio this is another method uh, we are using to find out upscale canopy reflectance so in this what we will do is we will take ratios of psnd a to pssr a and psnd b to pssr b of upscale dot reflectance and they, uh, and these two ratios are multiplied with canopy to leaf chlorophyll ratios and their average from this averaged value leaf reflectance is subtracted so coming to results so here we can see the blue one is the upscale the reflectance coming from the indices ratio or correlational ratio and this red one is the upscale spectrum coming from dart model so this is for the species one pyrospermum xylocarpum uh, from for dry season and wet season this is for uh, leaves collected from dry season this is from leaves collected from wet season which is upscale to canopy using dart and uh, cora this is for second column is for second species this is for another two species here you can see for lognifolia in west season the difference is little more the variation is little more same for champaka in wet season so these are the 10 species which we upscale using dart model and indices ratio here what we have to uh, so the r square from difference between these two models uh, is mentioned in this table here we can see that for polyaltia lognifolia pinnata and marsupium the variation is more as we have seen previously in figure uh, for example uh, here so this this more variation is because the leaf drift frequency is not smooth and as there is a chance of loss of original type spectrum so when the bunch of leaves are collected and they are uh, and their reflectance is find out they are not smooth and because there is a chance of loss of original type spectrum and also due to atmospheric effects during field acquisition of leaf reflectance the radiated canopy reflectance is affected for those trees in wet condition
uh, so these are the hyperspectral indices which we calculated for the 10 species in both wet season and dry season this first three are psnd next three are pssr here we can see that pssr have more values than compared to psnd so it means that pssr are more sensitive and we will take that for our chlorophyll analysis so coming to discussions as we saw the table previously photosynthetic pigments are more sensitive to pssr indices and here if you see the champaka cumini have chlorophyll a and chlorophyll b and carotenoid in same almost same proportion and lobnophilia has uh, high chlorophyll content and champaka and cesium cumini have less chlorophyll as you can see in this table based on the indices so we are considering pssr so it means that different trees have different types of proportion of chlorophyll a chlorophyll b and carotenoid some trees have say, three in same proportion some have chlorophyll and high some have less chlorophyll so based on this what we can say is so because different have different chlorophyll proportions we can do species level classification as some have equal proportion of three pigments some have rich in two uh, not rich in one some are very high pigment concentration so coming to conclusions this dart and cora upscaling approach is it is very useful for simulating forest canopies to canopy level and hyperspectral removal sensing as we saw it has ability of quantifying individual pigments within a plant without loss of pigments chlorophyll analysis in tons also helps in species level classification for some extent and as far as chlorophyll is considered canopy upscaling is a successful non destructive technique for its analysis and the study and also in future the study will be expanded uh, uh, it, uh, the dart and cora spectrums which we have scale it will be compared with uh, cris data sets or any other uh, uh, satellite data sets for more accuracy to prove more accuracy so these are the selected references which i put in this presentation so thank you thank you for your presentation so any questions to sign Hussain, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I am not the expert of the remote sensing and this kind of uh, okay, okay. Um, hyperspectral images and others. But uh, uh, okay. do you use any uh, hyperspectral sensors in this in your research? Or, for example, Sentinel or other kind of uh, hyper hyperspectral yeah. sensors? Do you use the, the indices which we used are hyperspectral indices? Actually, as you can see yeah. on screen. These yeah. are hyperspectral in, uh, indices, but there are lots of lots of hyperspectral sensors orbiting the uh, globe uh, and the uh, airborne and uh, satellite bone. So I'm just wondering what kind of sensors to use for your hyperspectral indices. No, this uh, see the indices which I used. Uh, so these values I took from the field spectrometer, spectroradiometer values from the field. Um, from the field for the leaves which i did spectroradiometer analysis uh -huh. so those values are used in the indices uh, okay yeah so any other questions and also uh, i am trying to say that in future next as a next study what i want to do is uh, as you can see last point i am adding i am also uh, doing uh, i am using cris data sets cris you can mm -hmm. you know is a hyperspectral instrument uh, uh, okay yeah in future i will compare i will compare this accuracy again with cris so in order to prove more accuracy that i am going to do again for now i did it in two ways one is dart and indices ratio mm -hmm. Next, I'm going to do using traces. Okay. So, any other questions from uh, other panelists, speakers, or audience? Okay. Thank you, Hussain, for your great presentation. Thank you. Yep. And then uh, we start next presentation on three twenty. So we'll have a five minutes break. Thank you.
Okay, let's resume our session. Now we have the last presentation from Nalin Jain. So I would like to check whether Nalin Jain is here. Nalin, yeah, yeah. Hello. Okay, great. So over to you. Please start your presentation by sharing your screen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Am I screen present? Yeah, I can see that. Okay. So myself Nalin Jain and I am part of from JCRC College Jaipur from Electrical Stream. And I am also a member of uh, Active Special Science Research Group. And my title is on Geospatial uh, Geospatial Analysis of Powering Dima Powering India for Future Generation. This is my outline of presentation. Uh, introduction, purpose of study, methodology, graph study, scope for future advancement, and conclusion. From introduction, introduction uh, basic element of power systems are like generation, transmission, and distribution. Energy generation depends on renewable and non renewable sources of energy. Since power demand is increasing day by day, it is also a fundamental infrastructure input for development. Even in financial year 2019, Indian government and uh, their state government started a joint initiative, 24 7 power available, uh, power for all campaign for making uh, electricity available 24 7 for all households, industries, commercial, and public needs. Uh, what we are doing in geographical research is uh, we, are, uh, we are analyzing the power demand data of every state of India with respect to their population, their GDP their per capita conju uh, power consumption. So after analyzing the demand data of power, we can easily distribute the power in different power sectors, like uh, in industrial, domestic, uh, agriculture, commercial, and also uh, like uh, make work to fulfill their power demand. It will help the, uh, it will help the manage the distribution system and also develop and improve growth of the power uh, national economy. About the purpose of study, uh, after the we have pattern of power demand, we will able to do better planning of power distribution at every sector. Uh, as uh, population is increasing day by day, the power demand is also increased. So by maintaining the distribution of power, it will help to strong economic growth, and we can export more more electricity by managing power system. Uh, if we know about the daily limits of power consumption, we use less, but uh, best resources according to meet power, power demand. Uh, with management of power system, electricity will available at low cost. And also it is easy to uh, reach out the rural areas also. And uh, this is my methodology. Uh, in step one, uh, I collected data of population, GDP, and uh, uh, power consumption of uh, year 2019. In second step, uh, we correlated data uh, inputs to the power consumption per state. In third step, uh, I represented data with the help of QGIS and get estimation of power demand. How we, uh, how their population, their GDP, their uh, per capita power consumption are related to each other. In the last step, uh, in the fourth step, uh, after getting the idea of power demand pattern, we can control the power generation and it will uh, like easy to manage distribution of electricity. If uh, like uh, if power generation pattern meets the daily demand of electricity, it will help to improve economic growth of country. Right. Uh, in, uh, in graph study, we can see the population of uh, India's graph uh, in 2019. For the purpose of study, I uh, data I divided into five classes. Uh, the red red color shows the maximum uh, range of the population, and blue color is uh, like show for the low population. And uh, in the second graph, the total power consumption, uh, we can see where the lead mass area is high. The Power consumption is also high there. So this is the data representation of uh, power consumption. Uh, in the third graph, 
the gdp gdp also a affecting factor of power consumption we import and export supply of electricity if power system is managed by analysis the uh, demand pattern we are able to export more electricity to uh, other countries increment uh, in gdp has in development and growth of economy uh, the per capita power consumption uh, india's per capita power consumption is around uh, 1184 kilowatt per hour average and uh, the next graph uh, this is a uh, electricity price uh, per state uh, i took a uh, base thousand because of uh, in elect, uh, in every state uh, the price of electricity the electricity price is different and around uh, 350 to 400 unit after the electricity is uh, electricity price is constant so i took 1000 unit as the base and uh, this is the power consumption in uh, like uh, four for power sectors this is for domestic sector and this is uh, for industrial sector this graph is for uh, represent the industrial consumption of power this graph is for commercial sector and uh, this is unit in uh, gigawatt uh, hour and power consumption in agriculture sector this is the graph of it Uh, the future scope of uh, power consumption uh, this project is uh, means by estimation of power demand we are able to involve more renewable sources to generate electricity because uh, like uh, non conventional source is in power generation are bit difficult to handle okay so uh, scale of power distribution enhance uh, automatically according to increase in uh, population so we have to manage power system also uh in third uh, scale of distribution power uh, will large like uh, by estimation approach of power demand we can plan better for economic growth and development of uh, countries in power system this is my conclusion uh, like uh, we population gdp electricity price uh, are uh, per unit are related to each other in manner of consumption of power we can maximize the use of use of renewable sources uh, if we know about the daily demand pattern of the power consumption after analyzing the demand pattern it is easy to handle power distribution at different power sector it is also reduce the cost of storage capacity because uh, if we know about the uh, demand pattern of the daily limit then we can generate that much electricity electricity that we can consume a uh, daily basis so uh, storage capacity will be less required so thank you if you have any queries then you can ask me i have one question okay uh, like you know about that the maximum amount of uh, electricity comes from the thermal power plants right right Uh, so uh, what and uh, the efficiency of those power plants so it's 50 to 55% only so if uh, the efficiency can be increased to 70% or 80% then don't you think that the resources you to uh, like before using the storage capacity before reducing that don't you think we will be using um, like we will be extracting more energy from the natural yeah, resources yeah yeah but they are non conventional uh, like uh, non renewable sources we, we uh, in future like uh, we have to depend on renewable sources okay so or so it will be better uh, to use uh, more renewable sources in the power system definitely but in your opinion what to substitute the thermal power energy we we can't substitute but we can limit the we can use limitation on the thermal power plant we can maximize the uh, input of uh, non uh, renewable sources of energy and uh, minimize the use of indirectly that is substituting the power plants right yeah so that's why i'm asking like indirectly even if i maximize suppose a renewable energy is the wind energy 
and it is contributing suppose 10% now and i yeah. we developed in so much that the usage of the usage and the gathering of the energy through wind uh, wind energy uh, is increased to 60 65 70% so indirectly it's affecting the usage of the thermal power plant right so in your opinion yeah. what would uh, like would be the substitute a good would, what can be a good substitute renewable energy rather than using the thermal power plants uh, if you want to develop something that's my art question actually like uh, government is uh, daily uh, daily pl- uh, planning for this purpose uh, daily to planning for this purpose and uh, we are uh, like in digitalization and uh, we have to, we are uh, like now in current situation uh, thermal plant can't be substitute because uh, their efficiency is really high okay but uh, we are planning for uh, on renewable sources uh, we are making uh, more yes you have misinterpreted in my question i am asking the same thing like what would be the substitute energy source that would sub, like that would replace the usage of thermal power plants what in your opinion like it can be wind it can be water nuclear nuclear be, uh, nuclear actually uh, nuclear efficiency yeah, you think uh, nuclear energy source would be replacing that uh, thermal power plants ah uh, but uh, like uh, uh, in like uh, is pollution free no doubt the nuclear yeah, yeah, yeah. power plants is pollution free but it's hugely but hazardous our... and it yep. can it uh, like requires huge amount of pitch blend ore if you are using uranium and other ores that is very costly and that is not easily available for india you have to bring it ah, yeah, yeah yeah right 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 and uh, if uh, it has to be uh, needed for a huge amount of infrastructure huge developed infrastructure because uh, it's uh, like uh, you know about the energy ca- got from uh, the nuclear uh, things that they use the thermal emission like a nuclear emission uh, system to generate heat and then from that heat the energy is produced that is converted into electrical energy so like uh, if like uh, it's not renewable right the uh, ores for the uh, nuclear radioactive materials is also limited we can't produce it unlimited yeah. so we have to rely on uh, natural sources that like that will stay for a billion of years like the wind speed or the water or any other thing that may that it's not uh, discovered yet or may will be discovered in future so that's i'm asking like uh, uh in that natural resources what can uh, like in your opinion in your uh, idea what can substitute the thermal power power supply uh actually we are uh actually uh, like uh, in efficiency uh, manner uh, like uh, we in present uh, in present situation uh, we uh, like uh, most of the energy comes from the uh, like uh, non non renewable energy sources okay but uh, we are planning uh, for better uh, power to generate better power uh, like we are de- doing daily projects on uh, re- uh, renewable energy sources f- to maximize the uses <laughs> of it but uh, uh, my my aim was uh, to generate demand pattern so we can uh, so we can distribute the power that we are generating in in planning way so the uh, jo waste of, uh, of energy will uh, reduce and we can export more energy towards the other, other countries so we can uh, like uh, it will help to grow our country you know how much of scarcity of energy in india persists today you are talking about exporting like yeah. it's it's if it is surplus uh, and like it is we, it is we are so in our country then only we can export right if it is right, like right, there right. is scarcity of power in india persists like 20 25% then do you think it would be wise to export that much of energy to outside the india actually at last year the energy generated 1500 gigawatts uh, 
टेरा वाट पर आवर ठीक है बट इन वी कंज्यूम ओनली थर्टीन एटी टू गीगा वाट पर आवर तो वाट अबाउट टू हंड्रेड गीगा वाट पर आवर देट देट एनर्जी इज वेस्टेड बिकॉज ऑफ द बिकॉज वी डिडेंट डू सच ग्रेट प्लानिंग टू स्टोर द एनर्जी ऑफ इट अब इफ वी जनरेट देट मच एनर्जी देट वी कंज्यूम इन डेली बेसिस so we don't have to store that uh, amount of energy so we can reduce the cost from there so it will help in uh, our gdp cost it's like there are so many villages in so many states of india you can yeah yeah so uh, that that doesn't have electricity till now so yeah yeah right we can't say like if uh, we are not using that means it's getting uh, surplus like it's getting stored If you are not yeah. we using it, there another way it should be that we are we cannot use that because we don't have that uh, sufficient uh, development because there are so many yeah, villages yeah, in yeah. India yeah. doesn't yeah. have yeah. that yeah. much of energy sources. So yeah, like, yeah. for that yeah. we can't yeah. say that we have to manage the power system more accurate, more efficient by the help of uh, uh, study of demand pattern. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Great. Hi, Nalin. Nalin, I also yeah. have a brief question. In uh, for your study, uh, what your special characteristics are used? If there is, what's the difference from the generic data visualization in IT community? Uh, actually, I am a beginner in QGIS. <laughs> I use this uh, GIS part for the representation of the data only. Ah, uh, for the visualization purpose only. Ah, uh, only visualization part purpose only. Mm hmm. Oh, I see. Thank you. So, and any other questions? No questions. And then, can we conclude the session? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Nalin, your talk, and uh, I would like to conclude all the sessions. Thank you for joining our event, and thank you for coming here, and thank you for your giving a great talk. Thank you so much. And the next session will start twenty uh, minutes later, and the next session will be presided over by uh, uh, Mr. Chek Yu Sang. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you, Sangi. Yep.
Hello. Hello. The next speaker, Joy Timon. Are you ready? Joy Timon? Yes, sir. Oh, are you listening to me? Yeah, yeah, yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah, we'll be starting in two minutes or so. Please be prepared. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone. We'll be starting soon. Uh, my name is Kusong Choi. Uh, I'm the session eight moderator. Uh, just for your information, I work for Gaia 3D, just like the previous uh, moderator, Sang Shin. We work in the same company. So welcome to Force 4 Korea 2020 and the English track two. Considering the speakers today, track two seems to be an Indian track. <laughs> what do you think about it? <laughs> so everyone is welcome. Okay. Now the music is stopped. Uh, it's exactly 4 p.m. 
Um, the speaker for this session is uh, Dri Timon Das with the subject of the geospatial representation of radical new vision of air quality for Indian cities. Please welcome Dri Timon. Welcome. Thank you. Sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for giving me uh -huh. the opportunity. I'm very honored to be here today. I'm very happy. Well, virtually at least. Uh, I am Kritiman Das and um, I'm a postgraduate in geology. Can you see my screen? Oh, uh, yeah, I see. I can see. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I am Kritiman Das and I am from India. I'm a postgraduate in geology and I'm a GIS enthusiast. The title of my study today is the geospatial representation of radical new vision of air quality for Indian cities. Here today I'll be giving an introduction to the topic, the objective of my study, the methodologies that I've used, and finally the results and discussion. Today I want to talk about the, the invisible, the global pandemic that's underway. No, not the pandemic we are in right now, but the invisible, the giant gaseous bubble we are all living in, the atmosphere that we breathe in. And the quality has been degrading every year. <clears throat> it's a major health challenge and yet no one's talking enough about it or it's just being ignored or it's just taken for granted, you know. India is the second most populous country in the world and the seventh largest country by land area with a population of around 1.2 billion. It's a developing country and with the advancement of science and technology with the advancement of industries and in pursuit of a better, easier and extravagant lifestyle, we have put ourselves at stake because of the quality of air that we that has you know become of our cities it kills around 1.2 million people every year because of uh, conditions related to air pollution and out of this for around uh, around 0.1 million people are infants this is quite a bad side that's to be seen it affects our health, it affects our well-being, and yet, because we don't see it, we have chosen to ignore it. India is now home to some of the most polluted countries in the world. It's, it's, uh, the, India dominates the list of the top, uh, top countries that, that's ranked like the top most polluted countries in the world. Coming to the uh, measurement of air quality, it's measured uh, by the government using the air quality index. What is this? This is an index which is computed using eight different pollutants as its parameters. The particulate matters, those uh, fine specks of dust and soot, which is like 30 times smaller than the size of a human hair. This enters into a bloodstream, then cause heart diseases, uh, can give us respiratory conditions, even cause lung cancer, and in long term, reduces life expectancy. The, the values 2.5 and 10 denotes the size of the particles in micrometers. Then we have carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, lead, and ozone. The ground level ozone, which is a, by, which is a byproduct of sulfur, uh, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds. This, the sources of most of these pollutants are from power plants, from different industries, from construction sites, from transportation, from the emission of vehicles, burning of fossil fuels. But this year, we have all been struck by the coronavirus, the pandemic, and the nation went into a complete standstill in the month of March. So a drastic change in the air quality began to appear. 
like the skies were starting to appear blue again, which is a rare sight, in, especially in cities like Delhi. It's quite a rare sight. So this inspired me to this inspired me to observe the change in the air quality and its parameters before and after the outbreak of COVID-19. And I and also want, wanted to check the temporal changes of different air quality parameters in 2019 and 2020. So I collected data from Central Pollution uh, Control Board of India, the website, and I collected uh, data for 2019 and 2020. I collected daily data from starting from January 2019 to July 2020. And I computed monthly averages of each of the uh, each of the each of the months we were of each each of the parameters, and then I used these values to get my maps, which I generated using the interpolation techniques. I made maps for all the months from 2019 to 2020, and this is the guideline that's provided by the CPCB, the Control of Pollution Board. And I've used this to give my values a range in different classes. Here is a map of uh, the particulate matter, those fine particles, which are smaller in the size, 30 times the smaller in the size of human ear. So as you can see here, the changes in the colors, the colors in the darker sets, the sets in red, yellow, they saw poor, very poor, severe conditions, and the states in green, so mostly good, satisfactory, and moderate conditions. As you can see, there has been a significant change, especially in the month of April. You can see it's almost green, like this is quite a rare sight, and same goes for May, June, July. These are the time when the country was under a complete lockdown. This is a map to compare the two different years of the same month, March and April, 2019 and 2020. Here also you can see, especially in the month of April, you can see it's, it's, it's quite different. The, the scenario is quite different this year. But this proves like it's evident from the maps itself that the lockdown has been a great effect for the great, for the environment. This is a map of uh, <clears throat> particulate matter of the size of uh, 10 micrometers. Similar trend can be seen for this also. Uh, these are these are maps for sulfur dioxide. Here you can see there's a huge drop in some places, especially this place, Ahmedabad, this uh, city is quite polluted. You can see there's a huge drop in both the months, both the year, uh, in, in, in two different years. Nitrogen dioxide, this is also uh, one of the major pollutants in the country. And you can see there's a significant drop, there's a significant, significant drop in the two maps when you compare. Similar trend follows for the air quality index. January, February, March, April, you can see it, it goes greener and greener. This is, these are some maps just to show the severity of the situation. This, this was last year, especially around this time, it's highly polluted, especially December, January, starting from November. Here are some uh, graphical representation of the data that I have used for generating my map, the same data. The first graph here is of Delhi. It shows a huge drop in the pollutants like particulate matter 2.5, particulate matter 10, nitrogen dioxide, nitrogen oxide, sulfur dioxide. You can see there's a huge, huge, huge drop in most of the pollutants. This is also this this graph also shows the trend how it's reducing from March onwards. 
uh, March to July, it, it just gets lower and lower every month. Similar trend can also be seen in uh, the AQI. These are some, uh, these, are, these are data for different cities in the month of November, April, and 2019 and April 2020. You can see there's a huge drop in some of the cities like Ahmedabad, this is highly polluted city in Delhi. This is another one. You can see there has been a huge drop in most of the places. Similar situation is happening here as well. Now coming to the conclusion, the question arises here like if restrictions of movements can be an alternative effective measure to keep a check on the air quality. And since you know most of the sources of these pollutants are from uh, the combustion and the burning of fossil fuels in vehicles, yes, it does, does make a difference and it's quite evident from the maps that I've prepared. So this invites a discussion and the government should take some strict actions, strict laws, regulations. This invites for strict laws and regulations. And there's also a need for shifting to more cleaner and greener energy sources rather than depending on fossil fuels, coal, etc. With the <laughs> advancement of technology, this is quite possible like to shifting into cleaner sources of energy. You know, before banner starts hovering above the skies and saying breeding kills, we need to take a step ahead and we need to shift to a different side and we need to be more alarmed and awake. There's a saying that we don't need to save the planet. The planet finds its way to save itself. We need to save ourselves. So this is a lesson to be learned. This is our wake up call. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, for the uh, very impressive presentation. Thank you. Sir. Any question from the audience? Directman? Yes, sir. I have a question. Sure, sir. Uh -huh. You have shown a snapshot of the air pollution. There must be some time series snapshots. Combining the time series data, can you uh, try uh, motion pictures just like a simulated results? Sorry, I did not exactly get that, sir. Not yet? No, 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 not yet. Uh huh. Do you have any plan to make yeah, a? Yeah, I, I plan to make some. This is just the initiation of the study, so I plan uh -huh. to make some more. Mm -hmm. make this if study. there is such kind of time series data and its visualization, that'll be great, and we can monitor how it changes over time. Okay, sir. I strongly encourage you <laughs> to uh -huh. do yeah, your yeah, further studies. Will try. That's it. Any other questions? Um, if not, then this is the end of uh, uh, the presentation. And the next presentation will resume at 4.20. So we are going to have five minutes of break or so. The next presenter is Priyam Nayana. So please be prepared for the next presentation. Yes, sir. Uh-huh, good. Mm -hmm.
Okay, everyone. Um, we are going to resume the next presentation. Um, before we move on, I'd like to ask you to our dearest presenters, uh, ask a request for you. Please make the most of your given time. You are given 20 minutes. So please take advantage of more than 15 minutes. Less than, but less than 20 minutes. So that's my uh, guidance for your presentation. Uh, if you are not pre uh, prepared that much material, then speak slowly and uh, encourage the audience questions, things like that. So the next presenter is Priyam Nayana Neog with the subject of India breathes, breathes easy amid lockdown, a geospatial evidence. Please welcome Priyam Nayana Neog. Hello, everyone. Hi. Namaste from India. Mm -hmm. My name is Priyam Naina Neog, and mm -hmm. I thank you for this opportunity to uh, present in such a huge international platform. Mm -hmm. um, my, ple uh, my pleasure. Yeah. The problem is that the webcam of my laptop is not working, so I just wanted to introduce myself to the phone. Great. And if I take a minute to log in from my uh, laptop as well. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Uh huh. Priyam. All right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um. Uh. Is there any problem? No. Am I audible? That's what I was asking. Okay. Okay. I can see your presentation slides. Okay. Cool. It's all right. Great. It's all right. All right, um, mm -hmm. so the topic of my presentation is uh, India breaths easy amid lockdown, a geospatial mm -hmm. evidence. Oh, great. The study was under the guidance of Ms. Salguna and Nair. During the span of the presentation, I shall be introducing you to the topic of my discussion, its objective, the study area, methodology that was used to get the final result and conclusion. Uh, to introduce my topic, uh, let's start with air pollution. So it is the emission of pollutants into the air that are harmful to all living things and also the planet as a whole. The coronavirus pandemic, even though it is a deadly virus, it has had a positive impact on the environment as we all know. Uh, the lockdown affected the air quality of the entire country at a large scale. So uh, the change in the quality of air from just prior to the lockdown and a few days into the lockdown was clearly evident. So which drew a lot of attention to the usual unhealthy and unhygienic air condition that was prevailing in the country. So different studies were done and uh, articles were also published. And then it was observed that the air quality significantly improved. So it begs to question the importance of uh, such temporary lockdowns for you know, suitable time intervals 
and if that will help to mend the environment. The sole objective of this study is to determine the change of air quality before, during, and after the lockdown, the connection of wind direction and speed with the pollutants and the air quality, and to check the uh, basic health condition of the common uh, public due to the air quality and how the lockdown has impacted the health of the common public. The study area is entire India. As my earlier contestant has said that it is the most, second most populous nation with the seventh largest land area. Uh, India is also one of the first fastest growing economy. So which obviously leads to you know, uh, adverse effects on the environment since growing of industries. Since the industrialization happened, uh, it has been a hard effect. It has played a hard role on the environment which has indirectly affected the human health and the lifestyles. Uh, the study uh, considers three time periods, pre-lockdown, lockdown, and unlock. So for pre-lockdown starts from 1st of January to 24th of uh, March of this year, the lockdown from 25th of March to 31st of May, and unlock from 1st of June to 1st of September. For my deductions, I have taken into account 31 pollutant parameters. However, for this presentation, I shall only be showing results for 13 of them as we have a limited time and I'm considering only the most important parameters. The data was gathered from 231 monitoring stations that were spread all over India. And the average for each parameter was calculated and then dot density was uh, done in QGIS to get the final outcome. The first parameter is carbon monoxide. So it is a, a highly toxic pollutant as we all know, and it is mostly created when released into the air when something is burned, and mostly fuels in vehicles and uh, other heavy machineries. So even in household when we use fossil fuels, a minute amount of carbon monoxide is released into the air. So when we breathe in this highly toxic carbon monoxide air, it reduces the oxygen transportation in our body and uh, results in major health issues like severe headaches and increased heart diseases. Uh, the dot density analysis for, that was calculated for carbon monoxide clearly shows a high level of uh, concentrated uh, amount of carbon monoxide during the pre-lockdown in the northern part of India, in Gujarat, then in uh, Maharashtra, Mumbai, Maharashtra, and in other parts of India, it is ranging from medium to high. However, during the lockdown, we can clearly see even in the northern parts, it has reduced to a low to medium range. And in Gujarat, Maharashtra, and in other parts, it is also ranging from very low to medium. Uh, during the unlock period, uh, even though it is sh showing as very low, I have only calculated uh, data till 1st of September. So this is just a result of the uh, lockdown. This, uh, these are the maps uh, showing the uh, connection between the three uh, periods, pre-lockdown, lockdown, and unlock. And it clearly shows, the, clearly shows that the level of concentration of uh, carbon monoxide has reduced. Next is ammonia. Ammonia is one of the most abundant uh, pollutant in the atmosphere, which adds to air pollution. The main sources are uh, agriculture, animal husbandry, and fertilizers. Other than that, industrial processes and vehicles also emit ammonia gases, but in small quantity. Uh, ammonia mainly combines with sulfates and nitrates to form fine particulate matter, which is PM 2.5. And this is a very harmful uh, pollutant, which has a great effect on human health and environment. Looking at the dot density, we can see that ammonia is high in a very high level in Northern India and in Central India. Uh, however, in the Northeast also, we can see a medium to high range. In Meghalaya, we can see a low uh, range of uh, ammonia levels in the pre-lockdown period. 
However, in the lockdown, most of the ammonia in the central India has uh, is negligible. In the northern parts, also it is negligible. However, in the um, sorry, in the northeastern parts, it is negligible. In the northern parts, it is not negligible, but it has reduced considerably. In the unlocked period as well, as a result of the lockdown, uh, the pollutant is very low, but compared to the lockdown, it has risen uh, a small amount. This is a slide showing the comparison between the three uh, periods, pre-lockdown, lockdown, and lock unlock. Uh, it is very clear from this that uh, the concentrated level of ammonia during the lockdown has gone down, while in the unlock period, it has again risen compared to the pre-lockdown. Nitrogen monoxide. Uh, Nitrogen monoxide and nitrogen dioxide belongs to the family of nitrogen oxides. Their pollutants, these pollutants usually are produced from a reaction between nitrogen and oxygen gases in the air during high combustion, high temperature combustion. And uh, it is released from vehicles, burning fuels, industries, coal fired uh, power plants, etc. In the northern parts of India, sorry, in the northern parts of India here, uh, it is again produced from fire burned during agricultural field preparation. This practice is done to, uh, as when the crops are burnt before planting new crops in the field. So this releases a huge amount of nitrogen oxides into the air. This practice has been banned by the government recently because of the air pollution that it causes in the nearby states. Uh, nitrogen oxides is also produced naturally by lightning and uh, it has a huge impact on the human health can cause uh, damage to lung tissue respiratory problems etc and it has especially hard effect on patients with asthma so concentrating on the dot density analysis uh, we can see that it is high in the northern parts in mumbai gujarat then kolkata in bihar and in uh, Karnataka also, it is a high level of uh, nitrogen monoxide. During the lockdown, however, uh, apart from Bihar and Orissa, we can see that the rest of India has significantly reduced the level of nitrogen monoxide. Um, in, after the lockdown has been lifted, the effects of the lockdown is still prevailing into the unlock period and the levels are still less. But in the northern states, we can see that it is still uh, low to medium range of nitrogen monoxide level. This slide is showing uh, the comparison between the three time periods. And we can clearly see from the pre-lockdown to the lockdown how much it has changed. Nitrogen dioxide, as previously mentioned, is also a, a part of the nitrogen oxide family, and it is also created during high temperature combustion. As we can see from the dot density, it is high in the northern parts, central parts. It is uh, very high to high in all over India, even in Guwahati, Assam, then Sikkim, West Bengal. Uh, all these places have high concentrated level of nitrogen dioxide. During the lockdown period, however, we can see how much it has reduced. Uh, it is negligible in the northeastern states, and it is ranging from very low to high in the northern parts. And in the central India, we can see it is low to medium range. And during the unlock period also, as a result of the lockdown, uh, it does not show that much of a uh, rise in the nitrogen monoxide level. And uh, this is a, a slide showing the difference uh, that was seen in the nitrogen dioxide levels in the three time periods. We can clearly see how much it was in the pre-lockdown and how much it uh, dropped in the, during the lockdown. N uh, nitrogen oxide, uh, also known as NOx, is a collective term used to refer to nitrogen oxide and dioxide. 
uh, it reacts to form smog and acid rain as well as pm 2.5 and also ozone uh, both of which are uh, associated with adverse health effects coming back to the down density analysis anox emission ranged from uh, very high to high very high to medium range all over india during the pre lockdown then during the lockdown it drastically changed and dropped down to very low to medium only in bihar and orissa we can see a high and medium range of nitrogen oxide uh during the unlock period as well we can see that uh, it has changed to uh, uh, basically disappeared uh, apart from a very few states mm -hmm. it is very negligible in uh, in the lockdown and unlock period this is a slide showing the comparison between the three time periods we can clearly see the difference that has uh, occurred due to the lockdown ozone the next pollutant parameter is ozone ozone at uh, ground level is a harmful air pollutant because of its effects on people and environment and it is the main ingredient of smog which we all know is very harmful uh, it is created by chemical reactions between oxides of nitrogen and volatile organic compounds vocs and this happens when uh, pollutants uh, emitted by cars power plant industries etc mm -hmm. and other sources chemically reacts in the presence of sunlight sunlight is a major factor in uh, in the ozone levels it uh, becomes mostly unhealthy ozone becomes mostly unhealthy during hot sunny days and can travel long distances by wind as well uh, so even rural areas can ex experience high ozone levels due to this ozone can be both good and bad depending on where it is found so ozone found in the stratospheric level is good where is it found near the ground it is very harmful to the human health people most at risk are people with asthma children the older adults and it causes uh, coughing throat irritation etc it also reduces lung function and worsens bronchitis and it is bad for vegetation during the growing season as well taking into account the dot density uh we can see that it ranged from uh, medium to high uh, in the pre lockdown and it is spread all over india though and uh, even in the lockdown the ozone levels did not go, reduce to any level so it is showing as medium to very high and mostly in the northern part it is very high and the unlock period in the unlock period it is showing as a uh, a reduced level as a result of the lockdown even though it is not showing much difference we can uh, clearly see the effect it had during the lockdown which is showing in the unlock period next is fine particulate matter pm 2.5 particulate matters are of two types fine and the normal one fine is pm 2.5 and the other one is pm 10 the only difference between these two is the uh, size in the particles so pm 5 2.5 and pm 10 are tiny particles in the air that reduces visibility and uh, causes the air to appear hazy when levels are elevated so both are inhalable and cause and can cause harmful effects on the human health they are made up of different uh, harmful chemicals and are found they they mostly occur when there is a construction site nearby or on paved ro roads fields etc excuse me priyam 2 minutes uh, are yes. left for you okay so yeah so we can uh, the fine uh, to pm 2.5 and pm 10 has reduced considerably during the lockdown period and it is showing in the unlock period so uh, we can see here the same mm -hmm. has occurred for pm then also we can see it has reduced considerably this is the pre lockdown this is the lockdown and then this is the unlock period then uh, sulfur dioxide uh, it is also a very bad uh, toxic particle which is found in air, in the air and uh, from my analysis we can see that it has also reduced considerably during the lockdown and unlock period 
the wind direction and wind speed has a huge effect on the pollution as uh, the wind direction as it depends on how much it can carry with it wind direction and wind speed uh, they did not exactly reduced to any level, but uh, we can see that uh, it has had a major effect on the pollution. So uh, relative humidity, uh, relative humidity is uh, the percentage of water vapor in the air at a given temperature and uh, the rate of harmful or toxic chemicals in the air increases with humidity, with high humidity. So it causes dust mites and dampening of the quality of air. And coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 is especially bad in high humid regions. So from the dot density, we can see that it has reduced considerably. Relative humidity has re reduced. And again, it has increased in the unlock period. This also depends on the climate, of, uh, climate and season of the country. The next point is blood pressure. So blood pressure is a human health condition that may arise due to inhaling poor air. Uh, we can see during the pre-lockdown, the blood pressure levels in these regions are high, whereas in the lockdown period, due to the decrease of air pollution, the blood pressure uh, that was calculated for this reason has considerably uh, reduced. However, in the unlock period, again, it has increased a huge amount. So this is the slide showing the comparison. We can see clearly that uh, the blood pressure has decreased in lockdown, whereas it has again increased in the unlock period. The results for this study demonstrated that the decrease in the levels of these pollutants during the lockdown period compared to the pre-lockdown period clearly affirms that the fact that uh, air quality has significantly improved due to the mandatory guidelines of the lockdown. Uh, and the levels of the pollutants increased in air as soon as the lockdown was lifted and day to day life started. This study will help in realizing the drastic difference in the air quality before, during, and after the lockdown. And maybe temporary lockdowns might be effective in the future to improving air quality and controlling pollution. Also, the aim of this review was to summarize the uh, recent evidence linking air pollution and blood pressure in the three stages. So we, can, we could clearly see that uh, when the air pollution was high during the pre-lockdown, the blood pressure was also high in all of those regions, especially in Northern India. However, during the uh, lockdown and unlock, uh, due to less air pollution, the uh, blood pressure has considerably reduced. And uh, this proves that we need to take care of the environment so that we can take care of us. Kamsangvida. Okay. Thank you, uh, Priyam. Yeah, uh, before questions? we move on, I'd like to ask some questions about yes, your please. presentation. Is there any question? Okay, uh, I have a request for the next presenter. I have a question for Priyam. So please yeah. understand that we like to extend a couple of minutes for your presentation. Uh, Priyam, I have a question for you. Okay. Um, yeah. For the various pollutants, yeah. you've showed a lot of maps. Each yeah. map is displaced by five levels of qualified classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Instead of using quantified value analysis, why did he use the qualified levels? Because of this, it is very hard for us to understand if the improvements during the lockdown is the value the, within the range of uh, observation error, we are not sure. So why didn't you, why did not use the quantified values instead of the five levels? Do you understand uh, um, what I mean? Yes, sir, I do understand your question. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I just figured it would be easier to uh, understand the, mm -hmm. the very low, low and medium ranges instead of quantified levels. 
So we are not sure, not knowing the exact values, if right. the difference between the low and the medium, mm -hmm. are they yeah. within the range of error? We are not sure. Okay. All right, I got your point. Uh -huh. So if you can uh, recover that, uh, yes, yes, definitely. But this mm -hmm. is just an initial study anyway. I plan to do this for the uh, next three months. This was still 1st of September. So okay. I'm going right. to do it in December. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Right. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, let's move on to the next presentation. The next presenter is Pusali Chakraborty. So please welcome Pusali. Hi, oh, everyone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Am I audible? Uh, yeah. Please go ahead with your yeah. presentation. Yeah. Um, should I turn on my camera or just the screen share? I have to. Uh, just screenshot. Just to share okay. your screen. That will be easier for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Just a minute. <clears throat> Pardon. Okay. Now so I can see your slides. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. So, hi everyone. Have a good day. Myself, mm -hmm. Koshali Chakravarti. I have recently completed my MTEC in urban planning from VNIT Nagpur. Oh. Okay, and he's currently working in SSRG, that is Active Spatial Sciences Research Team. Mm -hmm. The project I'm going to explain is conducted by me under the supervision of group lead, Dr. N. N. Salguna, as you can see. <clears throat> so keeping up with the conference theme, that is BTS, that is beyond time and space, both, both of us have chosen the topic, which is uh, always one of the most important factors for development of an area, that is infrastructure. So my topic is assessment of physical infrastructure of a hill town, a case study of Gangtok, India. And contents of my presentation is at first the introduction and uh, some of the concepts I'm going to <clears throat> tell about. Then the methodology of my study followed by a brief about the study area, then data collection and data analysis methods, followed by uh, subsequent results and discussions about the results of the project and for the conclusion of the, about the study. So in French, infra means below and structure means construction. So this term, after being adopted by urban planners in 1970, these are further described as basic physical and organization structures and facilities. Uh, those are needed for the smooth operation and development of a society. Mainly two types of infrastructures are there, that is physical and social infrastructure. The first type, it helps uh, the development followed by the economic growth of an region, whereas the second one, it helps building the human capital. And its emerging importance is, is already proved as it has been considered as one of the 12 pillars of global competitive index, as well as goal nine of sustainable development goals, 2030. So infrastructure development index that compares and ranks the service condition of an area in a quantitative way. And it also monitors the status and progress of the development. Uh, also concentrate about the resources to the area uh, areas in urgent need, and also helps to shape up the policy framework as required. Moving over to the methodology of the study. Uh, so availability of physical infrastructure is analyzed at first based on the primary survey that was conducted in the study area in later months of 2019. So the resulting factors, those are compacted and compared to the service level benchmark factors called SLVs. Those are set by MOUD, that is Ministry of Urban Development in India. So followed by a comparative ranking is done uh, based on the extent of reaching the recommendation. 
and the key benchmark factors for each type of physical infrastructure are then passed through uh, the simple multivariate analysis this is called pca or principal component analysis to choose the most relevant and impactful ones uh, based on the consequent factor loading this physical infrastructure development index are uh, calculated uh, using the most relevant key factors in further classify and mapped in qgis Uh, at the world level of our study area so there come the study area location map as you can see uh, study area of our project is a uh, gangtok municipal corporation area it's a state capital of indian state sikkim so it lies within the east sikkim district of the state and it has 15 municipal wards as listed here it's situated said it is situated as an at an elevation of 1650 meter from mean sea level and this region has a year round mild temperate climate thus uh, so this type of climate setting makes it as a center of sikkim's tourist industry and tourism is one of the economic pulling factor of gangtok so now coming to the process of data collection and pre processing So secondary de- data for the study has been collected from Indian Census Data 2011, Comprehensive Development Plan or CDP of Gangtok, existing service benchmark guidelines, government policies and schemes. And this primary level data collected through the questionnaire based in situ household survey and meet with officials. So because of the uh, difficulties in terrain and time limitation for the study, sample size was limited to 60 per ward irrespective of the ward area and respective population uh for the collected data sets outliers and missing data values were omitted and further the reliability test was run cronbach's alpha uh, this results in 0.76 which uh, renders that the collected data set for the project is good enough So now coming to the data analysis part it gives an overview of each type of existing infrastructure those are considered and uh, corresponding service level benchmarks considered for each of them um, each uh, for each of each type of infrastructure these slbs are divided into further four parts access service quality efficiency affordability and sustainability so this is the water supply network existing in gmc area seven main zones are there having six main reservoirs that serve to 21 sub zones and 19 smaller reservoirs and total supply is uh, done under gravitational pressure so there's no pumping station yet and uh, subsequently areas along the central spine that uh, gets more time of water supply na day and outer area they get lesser so it results in uh, an average of 2 hours water supply at morning and evening daily and nrw that is uh, unaccounted for water water loss it's quite low in recent years previously it was much higher value a uh, sewage and sanitation network so um, the sewage and sanitation network of gangtok that is divided into four zones a uh, lower right uh, sorry uh, lower left zone that is zone 1 lower right that is zone 2 upper right that is zone 3 and uh, upper left that is zone 4 so each zone has one of a uh, sewage treatment plant and zone 3 is the most underdeveloped ones and treatment plants those are at a lower elevation it makes the pumping uh, facility costly there is a very high efficiency of collection and cost recovery but uh, because of the non uniformity laying of the existing network uh, sewage network uh, the average toilet coverage is much below than the recommended value it's only 35% whereas the recommended is 100% otherwise uh, rest of the slb factors are more or less uh, considerable next coming to the solid waste management system or swm there are three types of collection frequencies available daily alternative day and weekly and waste is collected in different forms like door to door or people can uh, deposit it in uh, municipal bins but this facility is not equally available at all of the wards 
of municipal Gangtok municipal area. So a certain portion of population they dispose SW solid waste in a unscientific way that is throwing to the river or streams or through burning. And the collected waste, those are transported to landfill site uh, 16 kilometer away from the city. And that is used in waste generation waste energy generation to the recycling. And uh, cost recovery percentage is low in recent years. So all of the existing uh, service level benchmark factors, those are compared to the recommended level with a relative value of one to five. And extent of reaching recommendation, like zero to 20% that is uh, given rank one, 20 to 40% that is two, 40 to 60% three, 60 to 80% four, 80 to 100% five. So all of these values for each of the infrastructure factors, those were summed up worldwide and a comparative ranking graph is made. Uh, as we can see the central words, that is uh, word number six, seven, eight, like that. Those are better in the sanitation aspect, but the current water supply to these areas, they cannot cater to its denser population. As tourists, uh, the floating population of tourists, they uh, come to these regions. So whereas the outer and southern worlds, they have comparatively lower rank in water supply and solid waste management because of the unavailability of uh, networking to those areas yet. So all of the key factors, those are weighted after uh, being normalized and further multiplied to their respective weights, uh, like factor loadings. And the summed up values, those divided by the sum of the weights given, uh, that results the value of PIDI for, that is physical infrastructure development index for all of the 15 words. And these are further classified into five parts. So as we can see in the map, uh, zero to one, the range is, and there are five classes. So words having, uh, those words having the index value less than 0.20, uh, those are critical areas. So those are needed to be developed in each term of uh, infrastructural aspect that those we have considered and what's having a uh, value 0.2 to 0.3 it has to be developed in terms of water supply and solid waste management aspect like uh, uh, some of the southern words and the words having a uh, PIDI value above these like uh, greater than 0.3 up to 1 uh, they may or may not have problem so those words can can be given the least priority. So as we can see, Chandmari, Ranipul, and Lower Siche. These three words should be given the first priority for the development. So after the data analysis, uh, we can have an overview uh, about the results and uh, discuss about it. So uh, PIDI or physical infrastructure development value that is calculated for all the 15 municipal wards in Gangtok area it shows a uh, non-uniformity over the world and also shows the relative extent of all aspects of service infrastructure. Those are considered like water supply, sewage sanitation, and solid waste management. And uh, readily points out the ill-serviced work at uh, once. So we can see from the previous map that uh, words along the central spine, that is uh, Bhutuk development area, uh, Aditang Devrali and some of the uh, newly development south, uh, southern words like Tadong. They have the higher uh, physical infrastructure development value showing they show the quite satisfactory service level. Uh, shortage of water in winter and storage issues, uh, those are uh, uh, mainly uh, frequent in southern words like Daragao, Siari Tatham Chen. So these words are to be placed in situation, those are needed to be looked after, but uh, that can be given priority number two, like uh, after the most critical area. So in the most critical areas, there are abundance of uh, infrastructure issues, like absence of proper drainage, increased unauthorized connection, that lessens the uh, final head pressure, and very less frequent solid waste management connection, that is at weekly level. So that exists in Chandmari, Ranipul, Lower Siche in such words. 
these uh, factors those put them at the lowest infrastructure development value and those can be considered as the most critically service worth uh, those are needed to be looked right after that is priority 1 so um, this um, indexing or relative ranking of the service level of the words uh, those are uh, further quantified uh, through pidi and it also shows the future areas of the focus uh, when uh, the concerned authority can extend the service line along with what exact type of service they have to give or they have to provide there and this study area they are in uh, that remains in hilly region and average elevation terrain height is a uh, 1650 meter from mean sea level so because of this terrain difficulty uh, easier provision of service infrastructure that is one of the difficulty it makes also costly so this study primarily helps to optimize the time and cost by prioritizing the affecting words also uh, this results and it, its after effect is can have a significant relationship with employment and poverty of our study area so this indexing can also be considered as an important factor in determining the future economic growth of the study area so uh, if better infrastructure system or networking can be provided there it can pull more tourists to those regions so as tourism is one of the economic pulling factor of the region uh, in result it can only help to grow uh, have an economic growth of the region um, my further uh, steps of the study related to this one mm -hmm. so thank you oh great Oh great, Parsali! Um, is there any question from the audience? Uh, or any comment? As for me, I have no question and comment because it is very well prepared. Okay. Yes, mm hmm. Uh, thank you, Posali. And uh, next, uh, present for the presentation. The next presentation is the last one for today. Uh, the presenter is Muhammad Rashid. Um, please welcome Muhammad with the subject of modeling the species of Araku forest using 3D dot model. Please welcome. Muhammad Rashid. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm, yeah. Uh, Muhammad, yeah. I'm Muhammad Rashid. I'm from uh, Kerala, India. Mm -hmm. I did my master's in technology uh, in uh, remote sensing and GIS from National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, Surat Kel. Uh, I did my. Uh, 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 I I would like to acknowledge uh, my guide, Dr. N N. Talguna for helping me to complete this project. Now uh, I will share my slide. Good. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I have worked in uh, dark software. Uh, the topic which I uh, am going to discuss is. Modeling the species of Araku forest. Araku is a forest uh, which is situated in uh, Andhra Pradesh, the state in uh, India, using 3D discrete anisotropic radiative transfer model, means dark model. One second. These are the contents of my uh, 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 my topic. First, I will just give the brief introduction about what is dark model, what is the radiative transfer model, and all. Then I will just uh, discuss the study area, then methodology adopted, and then results and discussion uh, conclusion. And then uh, there are some limitations in uh, uh, modeling the amok forest in using dark model. So I will just discuss the limitations also. So. Uh, uh, The uh, radiative transfer model, uh, uh, in short, we will call RTM. It's, it's an approach 
uh, which is a me me mechanistic, typically based method to understand transfer and interaction of radiation in a canopy. Actually, early earlier uh, the DART software was mostly used for uh, uh, using urban studies. Recently, it started it, it extended its its uh, application in uh, canopy uh, forest uh, modeling also. The art, uh, radiative trans, you know, uh, radiative transfer model is considers the scattering of light and absorption within a canopy. So uh, we are uh, since a, a radiative transfer model considers the absorption within a canopy. It is better to use uh, hyperspectral data for modeling this. So uh, DART it is an approach to simulate complex and mixed forest by dividing the scene into rectangular cells. Uh, these rectangular cells will be uh, 0.5 uh, centimeter in all three directions, x, y, and z direction. The information uh, which are simulated inside that rectangular cell uh, will combinedly uh, give us a 3D model. So uh, it contains its volume and scattering properties. So volume means it will be mostly the uh, distances, uh, diameter, and all. Uh, and all these things were collected from uh, field uh, 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 collected from the Araku forest itself uh, after doing our uh, field survey. Then uh, DART it also uh, it it helps to upscale bottom of atmosphere information into top of uh, top of atmosphere. So, uh, so DART in uh, in recent days DART is also useful for uh, atmospheric correction. So that is the one of uh, that is the one of the area which that is going uh, that is doing uh, uh, that is going to be helpful in coming days. So uh, that will stimulate the Earth atmospheric interface in a visible region to thermal infrared region region of the electromagnetic spectrum. In this study, I have used uh, uh, the data in, in between visible region and near infrared region. So this is the study area. Actually, this is a mock forest uh, created by me. Uh, we know uh, government, uh, if government is having a 3D model of a uh, of uh, uh, of economic, uh, uh, which is uh, yeah, if government is having the data about uh, which type of trees are there in uh, which area, it will be helpful for the. Uh, forest department to find which, which area the, uh, the uh, economically uh, economical uh, uh, trees are situated in the, that uh, forest area. So uh, uh, this Araku forest it is situated in Pade, Paderu Talu of Vishagapatnam district, and I have selected only a very small area, a 95 into 65 meter area only. So it is also the part of Northern Gut. So the methodology I adopted is first I uh, we have went for a field survey, then uh, uh, we did biophysical measurement, then construct, uh, construction was uh, construction of plot was then using DART software. In uh, then uh, input the collected tree data into that software, then uh, mock forest was created. The field survey uh, was done to collect biophysical properties of 70 trees of 10 different species means seven each uh, individual trees for each species was taken. And uh, uh, biophysical properties like uh, type of species, position of trees, uh, means latitude and longitude, uh, trunk height below the crown, trunk height within the crown, trunk diameter below the crown, crown height, leaf area index, that is the uh, important one, and crown type were collected from the field. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, the seen area is uh, 95 into 65 meters. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have collected the data of economically important tree, tall trees uh, only. The underground and small trees were negle neglected. So th these were the instruments used. So uh, Leica Distortum S910 was used to uh, measure the distances. Uh, it is a laser distance meter to measure distances. And canopy analyzer was to, uh, was used to detect leaf area index. And also Trimble GPS was 
used to uh, find the latitude and longitude and also field spec spectral radiometer was uh, used to uh, find the uh, uh, to take the collect the ref uh, reflections in uh, visible region and near infrared region so uh, that 5.75 uh, version of software was used and before that assumption was made uh, assumptions were made which, which was first one the surface is lamb version in nature the uh, data of the surface was not collected so now we have selected as lamb version uh, surface and then uh, it, uh, the second assumption was canopy structure of all collected trees are homogeneous uh, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, there is one more thing in uh, dart that simulates the radiative transfer using an iterative approach here we have done five uh, iterations and it all it also used flex tracking radiative transfer operating mode uh, for construction and it traces radiation flexes which are emitted and scattered within angular cone mode r mode r means reflection mode there are two more modes one is uh, transmission mode and radiation plus transmission mode so i have used mo mode r mode reflection uh, as a sub mode which considers sun as the only source of radiation and atmospheric as secondary so analytic model in which intensity of uh, bottom of atmosphere is derived from top of atmosphere with a function called phenolytic is selected as radiative transfer method then uh, optical radiative transfer equation it was the basic equation used in this analytic method and it was used to calculate the intensity of light traveled through different multiple scattering media and uh, while constructing uh, we have selected sun zenith angle uh, is given as uh, 30 degree and sun azimuth angle was selected as 225 degree and uh, as i mentioned earlier the iter number of iterations were uh, five and also the irradiant spectral databases were inputted into this uh, software as an sql file and then selected the kurus model as irradiant model and illumination as a method of determination of seen 3d temperature and uh, the uh, seen average temperature was uh, selected as 300k and atmospheric uh, brightness temperature was selected as 260k uh, kelvin and delta temperature was 220k uh, kelvin and scene was simulated using four wavelength spectral means uh, spectral band in uh, 450 nanometer 560 nanometer 660 nanometer and 900 nanometer which are blue band Uh, green band red band and near infrared band respectively and uh, the data about uh, data for 2d lambertian model was also uh, inserted as sql databases which is which are readily available in uh, uh, dart software itself and created three lambertian properties like soil leaf and trunk leaf area density was given as spherical to simplify the processing and a 3d vegetation that uh, sql was also added which are readily available in the software and uh, as i uh, mentioned earlier cell dimension in x y and z direction were selected as 0.5 meter uh, 0.5 meter earlier i told uh, 0.5 cm i am sorry about that cell dimension uh, was selected as 0.5 meter and the option crown is an option uh, while creating the uh, mock forest crowns as triangle clouds were selected and the individual leaf area was given as 0.003 meter square so all the leaves of the all the species will be having a leaf area of 0.003 meter square the crown shape was given as ellipsoid and the leaf area index which are collected in uh, from a field it was added as .txt file and also imported a database of simple branches as input and dimensions of trunk and crown for species which are given 
and also uh, the uh, reflectance of each uh, tree of uh, 40 uh, bands were also inserted to set up atmosphere the atmospheric database uh, skill database were in, uh, imported and appropriate aerosol properties were given and then uh, after that uh, i ran the dart and i got the uh, 3d scene in aerial oblique and terrestrial view false color composite fcc and true color composite tcc can also achieve using different combination of bands these are the details so uh, this is uh, as we have given the uh, latitude and longitude of uh, each tree after five iterations we got this uh, uh, this was the aerial view and uh, as i told uh, all all the uh, uh, ellipsoidal the thing was given all the uh, trees were given as ellipsoid so uh, that, that is the one of the main disadvantage of the elimination of the software they are having very uh, very uh, less number of uh, trees i mean uh, the uh, uh, leaf type and all they are they are having uh, 10 or 15 less than 20 types of uh, trees they have selected appropriate trees which are which look similar uh, so uh, uh, this species 10 different species which we were collected were not given in this uh, software so what we did is we have selected uh, uh, selected the uh, uh, leaf type and everything which is similar to the uh, trees which we have so this is the terrestrial view and uh, oblique view was also there so uh, actually this 70 were collected uh, as uh, from three field which is first uh, we have uh, selected 10 then we have selected another 30 okay. uh, then uh, in last field which you have collected another 30 so this is a blue band this is green band this is red band this is uh, near infrared band and as the combination of first three bands uh, we, we got i mean uh, sorry last three bands we got FCC and combination of first three bands, we got TCC. And the conclusion which I arrived is that 3D model is a very useful method to construct mock for us. It will be uh, helpful for government and authorities to find uh, the uh, position of uh, econo economically important trees in a forest and also and FCC and TCC also we can find. If you have data about biophysical measures, measurement and the location of tree in a plot. And the limitation, as I mentioned earlier, actual shape of each of the trees were not available. So uh, in uh, many of the researchers are trying to include more number of trees, uh, more number of different, uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, trees, different type of leaves and all. And data regarding branch and trunk shapes were not collected. Uh, so uh, th these were the uh, limitations of this uh, software, uh, which uh, and also many many of the. Uh, so now I am thinking of using this Dart software for. I, I did my MTech project in hyperspectral remote sensing. I am thinking of using this uh, Dart software uh, for uh, atmospheric correction in hyperspectral uh, for hyperspectral data. So that is that's what I am thinking to extend my. Uh, uh, my studies in uh, that software in future. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, thank <clears throat> you. Um, we have only a few attendants here. Nevertheless, yeah. any question? Ah, I have one question. Yes. yes. Um, Mohamad, what's yes, yes. the uh, next step of your study? Next step of the study. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. You, so actually, you've I, achieved I, something. And what's next? Yeah. What, what next means is uh, so I just uh, proved that 
that 3d model can be used if you have the biophysical measurements and location mm -hmm. of the tree we can make that 3d model if uh -huh. you have data of a big uh, i mean we have collected only the data of economically important trees only which means sandalwood teak uh, like that so mm -hmm. these are economically important and also uh, in some areas if we have the data about see, some uh, what Uh, health related any medicinal plants are there we have data about in this area we have medicinal plants this number of medicinal plants will be helpful for several sectors like uh, uh, government and uh, health department uh, etc and forest department etc so right. they are they are having they are having a data which they can uh, save save for future Okay. Yes. Very well. <laughs> Very well Thank done. Thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> um, now, uh, as a moderator of this track, I'd like to announce the uh, the official <clears throat> end of this track. Uh, before this, oh, before this, I'd like to. Uh, give my special thanks on behalf of OSGO Korean chapter to the Indian community. Um, almost all the presenters are from India. Without their participation, this uh, English track was not possible. So I'd like to give my special thanks to the, all the presenters and the supporting Indian community. I hope to see all of you at the next event or somewhere else. Thank you so much again and bye. Goodbye, everyone. You did a good job. Goodbye, sir. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye, sir. Mm -hmm. Bye bye. <laughs>